It's the industry's closest thing to a love story and a murder mystery. The sleek white jet interceptor constructed in Malton, Ontario in the 1950s could have been anything. It had the potential to become the world's fastest plane, our strongest defense against Soviet bombers, and the engine that would drive Canada to the forefront of the aviation industry. Instead, it turned into a $400 million pile of scrap metal that became the stuff of tales. Hello there. Today, we'll talk about the Avro Aero, its history, and more. So without further ado, let's get started. A short history. Avro Canada created the CF-100, sometimes known as the Canuck after World War II, when the British Royal Air Force was still recuperating and had no money to contemplate about a new fighter. It proved to be a great long-range all-weather fighter as the first combat aircraft designed entirely by Canadians. More importantly, it demonstrated that Avro Canada, a subsidiary of the British-based aircraft manufacturer, performed well in finishing a difficult project on time. Following that achievement, construction on the Avro Canada CF-105 Aero, a massive delta-winged interceptor, began in the mid-1950s. It gave a ray of optimism for the future of the Canadian aircraft industry, with the capability to meet Soviet bombers and possibly kill them in a conflict as far as the North Pole. Following the acquisition of the rights to design and manufacture the aircraft, Avro Canada grew rapidly, employing more than 20,000 people by 1957, making it one of the country's top employers. It attracted significant funding from both the government and its own employees. The company's and Canada's aerospace industry's confidence was sky-high, but like Icarus, it crashed to the ground. Details The Aero's development was swift, and it is widely recognized as one of the most advanced aircraft of its day, as well as for its power and elegance. It also contributed to Canada's position as a global leader in scientific research and development. It would be an understatement to say that everything about the Aero was huge. It was a massive undertaking in terms of size, scope, and ambition. The plane itself was massive. It was a big aircraft for an interceptor, weighing roughly 20,000 kilograms, 44,000 pounds empty, and having a 15.2 meter wingspan. It was also a highly advanced aircraft that necessitated the development of many of its components. It had the first computerized flight control and weapon system in the world, and it was faster than any other jet in its class. At 53,000 feet, the Aero was planned to move at nearly twice the speed of sound. The designers used scale models for wind tunnel testing because they didn't have access to computers or simulation tools. Why did it fail? On October 4, 1957, the first CF-105 Aero prototype was shown to a crowd of about 12,000 people who came to view the futuristic aircraft. However, the launch of Sputnik 1 into orbit by the Soviet Union on the same day, heralding the start of the space age and probably the end of the Aero's principal target, the long-range bomber, overshadowed that occasion. In a program that began in 1958, five Aeros took part in flying tests, but the project was doomed due to political and technical issues. The Aero was cancelled in February 1959 by the newly elected Canadian Prime Minister John Diefenbaker's cabinet, which was trying to save money. It didn't help that Diefenbaker, a teetotaler, had a strained relationship with Avro Canada's President Crawford Gordon Jr., who was known for his smoking and drinking habits. The Avro Canada CF-105 was never completed, and the RCAF ended up with the American-made CF-101B Voodoo instead. Avro Canada never recovered from the loss of the program and went out of business in 1962. A four-hour TV miniseries about the Aero program was made for CBC Television about three decades after the show was cancelled. It starred Dan Aykroyd, Michael Ironside, and Sarah Botsford and was titled simply The Aero. It was a dramatized look at the attempt to produce the supersonic jet. It went on to earn the biggest audience for a CBC broadcast at the time, perhaps emphasizing how important this plane was to Canadians. The Legend However, the Aero's legend did not die with its demise. Due to the circumstances surrounding the plane's demise, which included the trashing of all extant prototypes and all industrial machinery linked with the program, a series of conspiracies arose as to the reasons for its demise. Many of these targeted the United States, implying that Washington employed dubious means to kill the Aero and prevent it from competing with less advanced American designs. Many Canadian aviation enthusiasts are still fascinated by the story of the CF-105. Some people still believe that one of the prototypes was saved from demolition, which would be a major boon for a lucky museum eventually. Some observers proposed, jokingly or seriously, redeveloping the Aero as an alternative to the troublesome F-35 in 2012. The suggestion was flatly rejected by the Canadian government. The Aero's striking silhouette is still recognized by many Canadians. In some ways, the Aero was a Foxbat before the Foxbat, 
a super high-performance interceptor with certain obvious limitations as an air superiority fighter. Although technological advancements could have boosted the Arrow's speed, albeit not to the level of the Foxbat, the design had many flaws that plagued second- and third-generation fighters. The Arrow, like the Foxbat or F-106, could only have functioned in an attack role with extreme difficulty. Given the 1970s fast shift toward multi-role fighter bombers, the Arrow would have quickly taken on the appearance of a white and orange elephant. Now let's see something about the F-15 and F-16. The F-15 family of fighter jets is still one of the world's most capable and successful. The F-15A and B types have been retired by the United States, while the aged F-15C and D variants will be retired soon. The Air Force plans to maintain flying its significantly enhanced F-15E and F-15EX planes. The F-15E is an air-to-air -air and air-to-ground fighter with exceptional capabilities. The F-15EX, also known as the Eagle II, was recently acquired and features a sophisticated array of electronics, including a new radar, mission computer, cockpit displays, and the Eagle Passive Active Warning and Survivability System. The Air Force intends to purchase at least 144 F-15EX fighter jets. According to Air Force officials, the F-15Es will add muscle and numbers to the force without losing quality. We're taking advantage of an open line to create good, capable fighters at a rapid rate to recapitalize the F-15C and D fleet, Lt. Gen. Clinton Hinote said, comparing the F-15EX to a 4.5 or 4.6 generation fighter. The F-16, a longtime Air Force favorite, is anticipated to stay in service but with a new mission. Upgraded and redesigned F-16s will boost the fleet's capabilities for operations like homeland defense, where we don't necessarily require high-end survivability, but you do need a good, capable, and reliable fighter, according to Hinote. Other adjustments to the fighter fleet are possible, although fighters are not the Air Force's main priority. It aims to replace the Minuteman III intercontinental ballistic missile, upgrade and expand its aerial refueling fleet, and invest in artificial intelligence. It also wants to get its hands on sophisticated long-range air-to-air missiles. To make progress and keep up with emerging threats, the Air Force will need to strengthen its own culture and collaborate more effectively with its partners, particularly those in industry who are producing its new assets. That concludes today's video. Please leave your thoughts and suggestions in the comments area. Also, tell us whatever aspect of the Arrow piqued your interest the most. Make sure to like the video if you enjoyed it. If you want to see more videos like this, subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you in the next video.